How did the world begin? Where is God? What's that smell? What do you mean, officer? Life is full of questions which are sometimes tricky to answer, so we tried to find someone who could help. Krish Kandai is like most of the blokes. He likes Star Wars, football and Mexican food. Unlike most of the blokes, he is also the president of the London School of Theology. We plied him with as much coffee and cake as he could eat and asked him some questions about God, the world and stuff. Hi Chris. Hey Rachel. Hello. Um, it's really great to speak to you today because uh, I know that you love the Bible a lot and you've done a lot of studying of the Bible. You've got a master's in yeah. it and a doctorate yeah. in theology, so you've read a lot of it. So I'm dying to ask you, is the Bible true? Well, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is true. And, um, you know, it's the reason I'm a Christian is that I believe that the Bible um, explains or reveals God to us in a way that we wouldn't know him otherwise. Um, you see, there are certain things you can know about God from looking around at the world. I think, um, you know, a little bit with my science background, um, that the universe doesn't look like it was just a, a cosmic accident. It looks like it's been designed. You know, when, when people show me, you know, the scans of the, the baby they're expecting, and they go, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful? And, uh, you know, as a dad of six kids, um, there is something magical and wonderful and miraculous about a new life. And uh, when I'm holding a little baby in my hand, I, I don't think this is an accident. I think someone has put this together. So I think there are certain things you can know about God from looking at the universe. But it just like you can't really work out what a teenager is like just by looking at their bedroom. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, you can have a little bit of an idea of the posters they put up or whether they put their clothes away. You don't get the full picture just by looking at the bedroom. The best way to know someone is for them to tell you about themselves. Mm. And, you know, I hate it when people just judge me by my outward appearance or how I dress. The best way to know me is for me to explain myself to you. Mm. And so Christians believe that that's what the Bible is doing. God is saying, here I am. Yeah, you can wonder at the world I've made, but here's the real story. Here's the real me. And so in Scripture, God is revealing himself to us. And um, the wonderful thing about the Bible is it's full of different types of literature. Um, often people kind of confuse the Bible as being one book, but actually it's 66 books. Mm. You know, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And each book has a kind of different flavour. Um, it was written by all sorts of people in all sorts of um, circumstances. Um, it was written over many different continents, over hundreds of years, people from all sorts of walks of life. You've got um, kings and uh, at one end of the scale, and you've got kind of shepherds and, and refugees at the other scale. And so it's an incredibly rich book. And yes, I believe it is true. It reveals something true about God to us. Would you say it is literally true? Is it historically accurate and reliable? That's a great question. And I think um, when you use the word literally, that's a really important concept, actually, because when you pick up a piece of literature, your brain does a kind of automatic selection process. So you read a telephone directory in a very different way than you read a piece of love poetry. And, you know, is the telephone directory literally true? Well, yes. Is the poetry literally true? Well, yes if you understand how those genres of literature work. So, for example, there is a, a story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Now, is that historically true? Well, yes, because I think Jesus really did tell a parable about a Good Samaritan. But was there literally a Good Samaritan? No, it was a story that he was telling. And so, um, as long as I understand the concept of what's going on. Similarly, in the Old Testament, there are lots of um, uh, songs, or they're called psalms, of praise to God. And are they literally true? Yes. One of the psalms says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Was there really a deer that panted that we can work out was praying to God? No, it's a figure of speech. So I think as long as we're understanding it in the context and in the genre that it was intended, it is literally true. Uh, the second question, uh, or the second comment you made was about it being historically true. And for me, that is really important. I think the parts of the Bible that claim to be historically true are historically true. Um, so again, there are some stories in the Bible that don't necessarily have to actually have taken place. They're more almost like a fable or a parable. But for me, particularly the Gospels, which are 
the uh, kind of four biographies of the life of Jesus, for me, that is the most important part to have been historically true. And in fact, for me, that was like the gateway for me coming to believe that the Bible was true. Because I think in the Gospels, you have an accurate historical picture of who Jesus was. Um, one of the reasons I believe that is how honest they are. Um, if, if, as some people believe, the Gospels were made up by the early church, I think they would have changed things a little bit. Because one of the leaders of the early church was a guy called Peter. And the Gospels are a kind of continual catalogue of his failure and disaster. So I think there's some internal reasons to believe that the Gospels are, are historically true. I think there are some external reasons too. So when um, archaeologists have used the Bible, I suppose a little bit like a, a, a map of the ancient world, they've found the cities that you know, are referenced here, or the, the coins that they talk about uh, in, the, in the New Testament, the denarii, they've dug them up and they've got the head of Caesar in, just like it says in the Bible. So I think there are some internal and external reasons to trust the reliability of the Gospels. And I guess lastly for me, the reason why the New Testament, or particularly the Gospels, are the gateway for me to trust the Bible is that Jesus said that um, the, the Word of God or the revelation of God or the Scriptures of God are reliable. And at that point, he's referring to the Old Testament. And he made a really interesting comment. He said, not the least jot or tittle uh, will be removed from the Word of God or the law of God. And a jot or a tittle is, is like referencing the, the dotting of an I mm. or the crossing of a T. So Jesus is kind of saying here that the Bible, particularly at that stage, the Old Testament, is absolutely reliable. And I kind of think if it was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for me. That's a bit of a long answer, that's but I'm passionate that. about the Bible. Well, you mentioned the Gospels, and that's quite interesting because the Gospel accounts have a lot of stories of Jesus performing miracles. Mm. And I guess the biggest miracle in the Bible is Jesus himself coming back to life. Yeah. Does this mean that you believe that those events happen too? I do, yeah. I think at one level that the miracles of Jesus are, are, are really important. And we've kind of got ourselves into a funny place where people say, well, if it was miraculous, it couldn't possibly take place. And some people are even saying it's not scientific to believe that miracles could take place. I would like to unpack that a little bit. So look, imagine, please only imagine, imagine I, Krish, was going to try and start a new religion. And I was going to claim that I was the son of God living on the earth. And, um, you know, maybe I'm persuasive as a speaker, but I'm hoping you'd be discerning enough to ask me for some evidence. Well, anyone can claim to be the son of God, that's really easy. So I say, I'm gonna perform a miracle for you. This coffee on the table here, okay? Um, I reckon in about half an hour, it's gonna be cold, okay? Now, that prediction is gonna come true. Um, how do you feel? Is that, is that a persuasive miracle that I've been able to predict the future of this coffee? Not sure that would swing it for me. No, <laughs> because I think you can think of some good laws of thermodynamics that would explain why this coffee might lose its heat energy into the wider atmosphere. So the fact that you can find a scientific explanation of this disqualifies it from being a sign or evidence that I'm more than just an ordinary guy. So when people say, oh, Jesus couldn't have raised someone from the dead, he couldn't have healed 5,000 people, he couldn't have healed a, a leprous man because that's not scientific. Well, in one sense, all we're saying is, of course, you know, if you can explain it fully through normal scientific method, it doesn't act as a way to, to signal that Jesus is anything more than another human being. Mm. So you'd go, not impressed. But the fact that Jesus transcends the way that things normally happen that's how Jesus is revealed to us as being more than just a man. And, and this is important. I think it's really easy to be a Christian and to be a scientist and still to believe in miracles. I'm not a practicing scientist. I did chemistry at university, but my passion was elsewhere. Um, but I, I did enjoy the fact that in the philosophy of science, basically we worked out that science is just explaining um, how the normal functioning of the universe takes place. You know, science tends to be uh, based on looking at evidence, 
seeing what happens on a, on a, a finite number of occurrences and then making a projection about how things normally will take place. And that's good, that's all right. And in the ancient world, they, they kind of had a mindset that made sense of that. So everybody knew that dead people don't normally get up and walk again, yeah? That, that was scientific, you know, we've seen loads of people die, most of them stay dead, that's the way normal things are. They weren't somehow backward or stupid just because mm. they lived in another time. C.S. Lewis used to call it chronological snobbery, that we always think, <laughs> oh, they're stupid people, but they were just like us, they knew that didn't normally take place. So when they see Jesus raise, the, from the, raise people from the dead and then raise himself from the dead, they are wowed because they know that is transcending the normal way that things take place. So I think um, the miracles are not anti-scientific. In fact, the miracles work because we know how the universe normally operates and Jesus is just transcending those norms. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure.